Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to have you back for another Food for Thought. Um, and kind of an interesting weather day, too, with the snow and the cold temperatures. We're happy to have you here bundled up inside the Whaling Museum. Today, we're going to be talking about ticks on Nantucket and what you can do to protect not only yourself from tick-borne disease, but also your pets. And we've got two speakers for you, Dr. Malcolm McNabb and Dr. Scott White. Dr. McNabb received his, M uh, his MD and PhD from Temple University in the mid-1970s. He board certified in internal medicine and hematology, a fellow of the American College of Clinical Pharmacology and the American Heart Association. He has specialized for over 30 years in pharmaceutical research and developed in the development in the area of cardiovascular medicine. Malcolm was the chairman of the Nanticket, tic, Nanticket, it's kind of appropriate in a strange kind of way, Nantucket Tick-Borne Disease Committee and is presently the vice chairman of the Nantucket Board of Health as well as president of the Mariah Mitchell Association of Board of Managers. Dr. Scott White received a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from Texas A&M University in 1983 and a Master's of Public Health from Harvard University in 1989. He is board certified by the American College of Veterinary Preventative Medicine and in the epide epi I, I, medical, <laughs> exactly, my goodness, epidemiology <laughs> subspecialty. He served as chief epidemiologist for the section of Armed Forces Medical Intelligence Center that provided risk assessments for human diseases capable of affecting military operations around the world. Dr. White started a full-time small animal clinic veterinary medicine practice in 2001 on Nantucket and was the vice chairman for the Nantucket Tick-Borne Disease Committee. So with that, please help me welcome Dr. Malcolm McNabb. Hey. Well, uh, thank you very much. Before I get started, I would just like to uh, show you a gentleman that we all know very well. And we're going to talk about mice and we're going to talk about deer today. And all of those people do have some friends, but cer certainly we can probably all agree that there is no uh, lobby to support the tick. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to start by defining the problem of tick-borne disease on Nantucket. I'm going to be, talk very briefly about some of the medical aspects of tick-borne disease. In fact, I'm going to skip through those slides pretty quickly, but just give you an idea. We're going to talk about the epidemiology of the tick because you really can't understand what kind of preventive measures we need to take, how we can protect ourselves unless we understand the life cycle of uh, the black-legged tick. And we're talking about some various modes of intervention, which is probably the most important thing. And then we're going to talk about pets and tick-borne disease. And over the years on this island, we've talked about ticks forever, and we've talked about human disease, but very rarely have we really touched upon uh, prevention, your preventing disease in your pets, and also uh, what particular diseases your pets get. So what about tick-borne disease, human tick-borne disease on Nantucket? Well, <clears throat> there are four that have been reported and found in human beings carried by the black-legged tick. Now, it's sometimes referred as the deer tick, but in fairness to the deer, it could also be called the white mouse tick. So I like to refer to it as the black-legged tick uh, and it carries, again, four specific diseases we've identified. Now, there are other ticks on the island. There's dog ticks that carry other diseases. One of them, for instance, Rocky Mounted Spot and Spotted Fever, there was actually a case on the island several years ago. But we're going to concentrate on the black-legged tick and these four diseases. One, Lyme disease, which we all know all about, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and the fourth one, if you read the paper a few weeks ago, or if you read the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the two, you know that we now have identified 
another disease that's carried by the black-legged tick on Nantucket, and, and that's the Borella miomitoto, and uh, Toto E, excuse me. I have a, nie a niece that's a Japanese translator, so she, she worked me through how you actually pronounce it. The I's are actually E's. So these are maps I'm going to show you. Here in the Whaling Museum, there are maps everywhere. There's maps of the history of this island. Well, I'm going to show you some maps of the present time of this island. This is from the state showing, for instance, the incidence of Lyme disease. The darker ones, the higher incidence. And you can see, of course, uh, it's pretty widespread in the state, but certainly our sister island and Nantucket ourselves, it's a very high concentration of Lyme disease. Here's anaplasmosis. And you can see clearly we win along with Berkshire County out in the far west of the state as far as incidence. And here's babesiosis, which is something that's the incidence has been rising in the last few years. And essentially, it, at least in Massachusetts, is pretty much a Cape and Island disease as far as incidence goes. Now, a few years ago, a <coughs> survey was done in Tom's Nevers by their association, and they reported about 60% of either homeowners or visitors had acquired one of, at that time, one of those three uh, tick-borne diseases. That number is probably a little high. There's some methodology problems with the survey. I don't want to go into that, but the point, it was a high number. And then, you know, every fall we have the uh, WPI students come, and a couple years ago they did a study where they looked at Nantucket, Nantucket high school students, and about 44%, and this was a very good survey, by the way, because the response rate was very high. About 44% of those students had someone in their family uh, that had had a tick-borne disease, or particularly Lyme disease, within the last three years. So the incidence is high here. We do have a problem actually figuring out what it really is. For example, the state numbers only present or only capture those diseases that have been confirmed by laboratory diagnosis, not those done by a clinical evaluation, although they're going to start in, in last year and the next year start counting those. Just an example, in one year when in fact the state said we only had 43 cases of Lyme disease, the Nantucket Hospital through the Board of Health actually counted about 325. So we have problems with these numbers. We know they're high. And of course, the one thing we've always we frustrated with is everyone comes to this island, has a great time, and some people leave and take back with them one of these diseases. And I just hope that they go to some place where they're recognized. Because if you don't see this every day, you're not going to recognize it. I will tell you, when I was an intern in Philadelphia, I had a case of uh, malaria, which was just staring me in the face. But since in Philadelphia, as an intern, I'd never seen malaria. This poor lady sat around for about three or four days before anyone figured out what was wrong with her. So you have to be attuned to some of these diseases. Now, I'm going to very briefly talk about them from a medical point of view. Now, we all know Lyme disease. This is the characteristic spot, target lesion, erythema migrans that occurs in about 80% of the patients. The key point of Lyme disease is that the organism, which is up here a spirochete, will actually distribute through joints, heart, nervous system all over the body and can obviously cause a great deal of problems. If it's treated early and recognized early, you do not have those problems. It is very receptive to antibiotic therapy. You'll hear about the term chronic Lyme disease. Most experts say there is no such thing. What you're seeing is that you do have an immunologic reaction that can affect your joints for a long term after you've actually had the disease. If you're treated for it, the disease is gone, unless, of course, you're reinfected. Here is Miyamatoi, uh, and the key here is it looks like Lyme disease, except the fever to it is a characteristic relapsing fever, very much like malaria. All the symptoms of these diseases are all pretty much the same. It's like having the flu and not feeling very well. 
anaplasmosis. Uh, again, this, this disease affects the white blood cells and babesiosis, which actually, of the four of them, is really, can be life-threatening. Particularly, it, it mimics malaria in a way. Spleens become very large. And in fact, on this island, we've had three ruptured spleens in the last few years. So this is, this is of the four, the one that's most dangerous. The point is, they're all treated adequately if they're recognized early with antibiotics. They all have similar symptoms. So if you're on Nantucket in the summer and someone tells you you have the flu, you had better go see your doctor. The summer flu, the fall flu on Nantucket, to me is a tick-borne disease until proven otherwise. So what about the tick? How does the tick live? Two years. Ticks live a long time, a given tick. All right. I'll start with the egg. Eggs laid in the spring, the, at this point, when they hatch, the phase of the tick is called a larvae. They are not infected. They do not have the tick-borne diseases. They acquire it when they have their first meal, which is small animals, most often, at least on this island, is the white-footed mouse. The white-footed mouse is the reservoir for the disease. They have the disease, they carry disease, they don't have symptoms of the disease, so the tick becomes infected. Now, how many ticks actually have disease is often a question I get. Well, uh, Barnstable County Extension Service has been doing some research on the island and just, they have measured the diseases in the ticks at one site, so this doesn't represent everything, but roughly speaking, in the last couple years, the percentage of ticks that have had Lyme disease ranges between 20 and 29 percent. Babesiosis has gone up one year as high as 40 percent, as low as 5 percent in 2010. And anaplasmosis, for example, in their study in that one area, it was about 5 percent in 2010 and 0 percent in 2011. So somewhere in that range of 20, 30 percent, or low as 10 percent, actually are infected ticks. So once the tick has its first meal, it, it molts into what's called a nymph and is very inactive until sometime the next spring. So this is, tick's been sitting around a year waiting for its second meal. It, it takes a while for them to get hungry, I guess. And they, then at the nymph, they feed on larger animals, and this is where obviously a human, a deer, is the first larger animal. And this is our first opportunity to become infected. Then they molt into adults, and the adults then find themselves a larger animal, most efficient larger animal is the deer, because this is the point where they reproduce. The deer is not infected. The deer does not give them Lyme disease or babesiosis or anaplasmosis. The white-footed mouse does. So it would be nice if we could get rid of all the white-footed mice, but that would be quite a task. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a little while. So essentially, this is how the whole system works. A two-year cycle of the tick with the tick eating and three times. Ultimately, laying the eggs in the spring, going around a couple years, and reproducing on the deer. So it's tick production and <clears throat> infection of the tick that's important. So how can we prevent this? Well, this is the cycle again. We can use repellents and barriers to protect ourselves. Various, uh, we can check ourselves. We can put barriers on us. We can stay away from the ticks. We can use insecticides. We can do, acaricides is, is another term for pesticides for ticks. We can kill the ticks. We can kill the nymphs before they get to the mice. We can kill them afterwards. Uh, we can kill the larvae. We can, again, when we get the adults, we can use repellents and barriers. We can, I said, to reduce the mice population would be extremely difficult. There are so many of them. The way you'd have to do it is put poison out there, and I don't think we want to leave poison out around on this island, and there's other animals and so forth that eat mice, or we can 
keep the deer away from us or we can reduce the number of deer. So this is an example of some of the repellents. The most frequent one, most common one now is permethrin products. There's several of those available. And <clears throat> it's recommended best that you spray your clothes and not necessarily yourself. I'm going to talk about permethrin in detail a little later. Then there's these wonderful clothes now that are available. Don't look so bad, actually. And they're, av they're <coughs> available from many uh, suppliers. You can just go on and line and look at them. Uh, and they actually are, are very high, highly effective. And in fact, they are also encoded with permethrin. Then there's the famous four posters. Now, this is very interesting. The way these work is there's a central bin full of corn, and on the end are these rollers that are covered in, guess what, permethrin. And next to them are little slits where the corn falls down. The deer comes, eats the corn, the permethrin rubs on its neck. Now ticks tend to crawl up towards the head. And what I've showed here is actually a, a four poster on Shelter Island, where they actually have 60 of them. And these are a couple of members of the Tick-Borne Disease Committee. But if you can see, these are two scientists from Cornell University who spend their life in the field studying ticks. And you notice they're not wearing any special clothes. What they recommend is they both wear these wellies. And they told me that uh, as long as they've worn their wellies, they've never been uh, infected or bit by a tick. So very simple, very simple ways to pre prevent infection. Uh, so however, these are actually still considered experimental by Massachusetts Fish and Wildlife. And there are some issues with them. Uh, first of all, uh, there's some concern that they'll promote what's called chronic wasting disease in deer. Some of the work on Shelter Island has shown that some of the meat that's been harvested is full of, guess what, permethrin. You don't necessarily want to eat that. Uh, and what they've also found on Shelter Island is deer aren't the only animal that likes corn. And there's been quite an upsurge there of various rodents as well. And you get very fat deer. Uh, as well. So some places where they've been used, a, a NASA facility in Maryland, they've been quite successful in reducing tick population. Uh, there is a unit at the Linda Loring Foundation on the island and a control uh, uh, unit elsewhere. And the Barnesville County Extension is in the process of actually doing a project. And we'll see how it comes out. One of the biggest problems is these are things and have to be taken care of. The USDA says that one four post, you need one four poster for about 52 acres. On Nantucket, there's 30,950 acres, which means we would need something like 588 stations. Now that's crazy, of course. But say if we only did 25 in high density areas, it would cost probably the first year about 110,000. This is for 25, and then somewhere between 90 and 100,000 dollars every year after that to maintain them and take care of them. So the expense is significant, uh, and of course I'm not sure what the HDC would say about those as well. So <laughs> this is an option. And it's going to be a long while, if and ever you see them on Nantucket, we're going to have to wait for some more research. And the cost is going to be significant. And again, we would need an awful lot of them in strategic places. So Daminex tubes, this island is full of Daminex tubes. And there's people in this audience I know seem to love them. They essentially are cotton balls filled with Daminex, the mice take them, bring them back to their mice, they roll around in the cotton balls, the ticks die, it's wonderful, all right? At least in theory. The problem is, the problem is that early studies that were short-term showed them to be effective. More recent long-term studies suggest that they're not. Hard to interpret that because these were done not on Nantucket, these were done 
and other places where they have different kinds of rodents. Uh, the point is, as a board of health, we can't recommend them. I can't tell you not to use them, but I certainly can't give you them an official endorsement. They may have one advantage is that you see them around the yard, you're reminded that you have a problem and you'll be careful. So biologic controls, there are actually wasps and fungi and so forth that are actually toxic to, to ticks and uh, they really haven't been studied that extensively. Someone from a company that makes one of these fungi actually called me and wanted to use Nantucket as an experimental station. I don't think we're quite ready to be introducing yet something else to the island at this time. So our official position is that these sound interesting. We'll let somewhere else decide if they're any effective or not. Then, of course, one of the best ways to do this is is spray with permethrin. It's very effective. Uh, it will it will kill it will kill the ticks. So you can sp <coughs> spray your yard. And actually, some studies have shown there are about 400 families on this island that actually do spray their yards with permethrin. And there's vegetation management. Simple things you can do to get because what's really been shown is key here is that. Uh, Studies have shown that open grass sparse scrub habitats contain fewer ticks. Uh, ticks like high humidity. Uh, they don't like rain, but they like relatively high humidity. Uh, so excessive watering of your, of your grass certainly is not a good idea. But you can simply cut your grass, don't overwater, and clear your brush. And, and Actually, some studies have also shown that you have a higher incidence of getting a tick-borne disease closer to your house than farther away from it. So perhaps maybe this is a lesson for us all. Now, some thoughts on permethrin. <clears throat> Not very toxic in humans. That's wonderful. Because I've been talking about it all, like the whole world, permethrin's this, the secret. However, permethrin is extremely toxic to fish and aquatic animals and living on an aquatic island, I think we just have to be really careful about not overusing it. And it's actually used in human scabies and some head lice, but what was found there, after time, you actually develop a resistance to it. So I think permethrin is fine, but I think this island, we have to be real careful about it. One, because of uh, the fact that we live off of the ocean, and I do not want to see our ticks starting to look like this. All right. So, deer reduction, uh, very controversial topic. Fish and wildlife suggests that we have about 50 deer per square mile, which is extremely high. We've just, the Board of Health just finished an aerial survey using infrared and color cameras, and the preliminary results actually appeared yesterday, interesting enough, and suggest that we have about 51 to 54 deer per square mile. So it pretty much matches what uh, fish and wildlife do from estimations. And I want to point out that this was done about a month ago, so these numbers are post-hunting season, based upon that 50 to 54. Uh, so. Deer density and abundance generally correlates with incidence of ticks and tick-borne disease. Uh, most scientific studies, uh, let me go back, uh, wait a second, where are we? Here, here we go. Uh, most of the literature suggests that if we get the deer population <laughs> down to around 10 or 20 per square mile, you'll actually see a fall in tick-borne disease. There are places where this has been attempted, and they've all shown a reduction in, in ticks, in, in, limp, in nymph ticks particularly, and in some cases, Lyme disease. You'll notice that they're all small, though isolated areas. Islands, for instance, places cut off. And, and islands in, in Rhode Island uh, that do lack deer, uh, are not able to sustain a black-legged tick population. Now, there are a lot of theories to suggest that, and one of the recent ones is that 
Lyme disease and, and uh, tick-borne disease and tick numbers and all have to do with the number of acorns, for instance. Well, we don't have acorns here. We don't have coyotes here. The alternative theories don't necessarily apply to our particular ecosystem, so you have to understand every system is different. We have mice, we have deer. That's the, and the ticks reproduce easily on a deer. Each female tick can lay about 2,000 eggs, all right? A deer can contain 10 to 20 ticks, continuing changing, all right? And birth control would be nice, but it's expensive. It has to be done every year in places where they've attempted it have just failed. Crane Island tried it for years, didn't work at all. They reduced their deer population by hunting and they reduced the incidence of Lyme disease. So you can fence deer off, but you need a big fence, all right? This is a nice humane way of doing it, but you need a large fence. So this I love because uh, this is up by Ram Pasture. Key message, all right? We can talk about mice, we can talk about deer, we can talk about permethrin. We have to do all of that. But this is the important line. Check yourself when you get home. It takes a couple days for, for a deer tick to, or excuse me, black legged tick, all right, I want to be fair, to infect you. You have time to get that tick off of you, all right? Check yourself. Take a, some people suggest take a nice big brush and scrub your back, all right? So listen, we have a problem. We don't have the best statistics on the incidence of these diseases, but they're high. They're higher than they should be. They're usually well treated, except not all the time do we treat them adequately, do we get them in time, and people get really sick. It would be n nice to just spray the island with permethrin and get rid of all the ticks, but I don't think we can do that very well because of the nature of this island. I would love to keep all the deer here, but I think we need to reduce them. In the natural order of things, deer are supposed to have predators. So my talk is pay attention Keep yourself, check yourself, wear proper clothing, and uh, we'll get a handle on this eventually. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Scott, who will talk about the pet side. We have an ample supply of water bottles underneath the podium, I can tell. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to kind of talk. How much time do we have? So it's working out okay. We're, we clearly want to have enough time to let everybody ask questions and things like that. So let me just kind of work through a little bit of the general stuff about veterinary met. You know, uh, these tick-borne black-legged tick diseases transmitted to pets. And then uh, last slide or so will be just a little bit of the Nantucket spin. Some sort of some thoughts I have, particularly from, uh, on Nantucket. So uh, we're going to talk about the clinical diseases in pets. And one thing to identify pretty quickly is is that uh, uh, pets only get one of two diseases uh, from the black-legged tick, either Lyme disease or anaplasmosis. Um, there are forms of Babesia that will cause illness in animals, but the form of Babesia that we have on the island does not seem to have any uh, uh, disease in dogs, cats, uh, or horses, okay? Or any recognized animal species at all, really. We'll talk about pets and, and the role that they play in risk to ourselves, uh, a little bit on the preventive measures within the animal species, and then I'll sort of give you my little spin on some Nantucket stuff. So talking about horses, um, a lot of thoughts are is that they really only get anaplasmosis. Um, there's a lot of, originally when these diseases were first reported in horses, everybody claimed it was Lyme disease. Uh, and I don't mean, this isn't just on Nantucket, this is, you know, uh, across the United States. Uh, but Lyme disease was, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I tend to not get on podiums. Um, so, uh, originally, these horses, horses were identified as having Lyme disease. With research and over several years, it became 
apparent that once anaplasmosis was discovered, actually keep in mind anaplasmosis was originally called Ehrlichia equi. So uh, when that disease was diagnosed in horses, then researchers started taking a look at it. And the current sort of belief right now amongst most um, equine practitioners is that those early cases of Lyme disease were probably co-infected with anaplasmosis. So currently right now, I think most um, equine practitioners, uh, clearly the horses are exposed to Lyme disease. Does it cause illnesses in them? Maybe it does, but that really most of the cases are anaplasmosis. Um, the symptoms are very similar. Um, and then, um, so the idea here is that Lyme disease in horses is probably, if you go back into the literature, was probably overdiagnosed. okay? Uh, cats, big question marks, clearly they get exposed. I mean, there's no question about it that they've gotten exposed to these diseases. But from a clinical standpoint, uh, I think the likelihood of a cat developing Lyme disease or anaplasmosis is rather rare. Uh, it, it's reported to have happened. I think if we were going to see Lyme disease or anaplasmosis in cats, we clearly would see it on Nantucket and with all the feral cats we have in the whole nine yards. And I just, over 10 years, I can't think of any case that I've had where there was any suspicion that that cat um, was clinically ill because of anaplasmosis or Lyme disease. And I think most, uh, from a clinical perspective, I don't think that they get disease from their exposure. So the big animals that we want to talk about, or not the big, but the common one is are dogs. Dogs do get Lyme disease and anaplasmosis. They get both of those diseases. Um, the acute cases, uh, the dog's sick, they actually the symptoms are rather similar. They tend to run a fever, maybe they have some swollen lymph nodes, a, a painful joint somewhere. Sometimes they're just not feeling so good, almost a flu-like, those dogs don't, dogs don't get flu, but almost a flu-like kind of I'm not doing so good kind of thing, I haven't eaten my meals for a day or so and that kind of stuff. And so the symptoms on a, generally are rather mild initially and they tend to respond fairly rapidly to antibiotics. Doxycycline is the number one that we use. Um, animals that are co-infected tend to have a little bit more illness, but they still are co-infected, meaning you know, Lyme disease and anaplasmosis together. Those dogs tend to be a little bit sicker, but they still tend to respond very rapidly to antibiotics. So we, they're considered to be very treatable diseases. Um, the real questions that we, when we get into dogs are these asymptomatic, meaning the dog's not having any clinical signs, but when we do, we have tests that are generally recommended to be done on an annual basis for dogs. It's, we have these combination tests now where we can test, draw one blood sample, check for the heartworm test, and then we also have tests that combine uh, doing a screening tests for uh, Lyme, anaplasmosis, and also Ehrlichia. Uh, these are just combination tests. Um, so, it's not, it's rather common for us, you know, particularly on Nantucket, but other places too, that when we draw that blood sample, it comes back and the animal's uh, clinically okay. It's, it's the routine physical exam for the year, but they come back positive for either Lyme disease or anaplasmosis. Anaplasmosis, we don't know a lot about, you know, the potential for risk to that animal with a chronic, potentially a chronic exposure. And remember these tests, tests for antibodies. These are what the immune system makes in response to being infected at some point in time. So when we get these tests back for both anaplasmosis and Lyme disease, that doesn't prove they have an infection. It means they've been exposed and they have antibodies, but it doesn't prove that they have an infection. So our concern with pets, dogs, that are serially, commonly, repetitively positive on these serologic tests is, does that put them at risk for something? And with anaplasmosis, we don't think that there is anything that we can identify. But with Lyme disease, there is some concern that a dog that potentially has a chronic infection, even that it, may, it might be a low-grade sequestered type of infection somewhere, is the possibility of them having a higher incidence of kidney disease. So that's, that's a real dilemma that we have. In a, a clinical case, dogs running a fever, it's limping, it's got a swollen joint, put them on doxycycline, two days later they're better. Hey, it was probably Lyme disease or anaplasmosis. But it's these dogs that come back and test positive. We really don't really know what to do with them. There's things that we do, we do kind of suggest that uh, we can take a look at and see whether or not they're having any problems related to the Lyme disease by doing some other tests. But this is the real dilemma that we have in veterinary medicine right now is, uh, again, that clinically normal dog that's still testing positive. So. Um, so what do pets mean for us when we are pet owners? And what kind of... Uh, um, risk does that, does that impose to us? Well, you know, they can bring ticks to us. Uh, they go out, they run around the yard, they go to Sanford Farms, wherever the case may be, off in the woods. 
dogs and cats, they come home to the house and, you know, some ticks do fall off. They don't stay, they don't attach to the pet. And so that pet comes into our living area, pet, the tick falls off, and then we go and sit on the sofa or something like that. And, you know, you get the tick on them. I've had them like that on me before. Um, and we talk about, you know, during the process of grooming the pet or when the pet comes into our house. But I, another place that I don't know, you don't see it mentioned much, but that's our automobiles. I mean, we've taken the, the dog to the farm or to the, the walk. We bring them home and, you know, the dog rides in the back seat or on our lap on the way home, whatever the case may be. But then we go and pick the kids up at school and the kids are to take, you know, they're in the back seat on the way home. And, you know, I think that that's a potential way for um, you know, exposures to occur. Um, and certainly, if we have our pets, whether dogs, cats, dogs, cats sometimes, or and horses, clearly our activities with those with our pets are taking us into uh, tick uh, uh, infested areas. So certainly, I do think that pets increase our chance of exposure to these tick-borne diseases. Uh, preventive measures in our pets, uh, very similar. Uh, uh, steps that Malcolm mentioned earlier as far as just personal protection. Same thing works for, for their, our dogs particularly. It's kind of hard to control cats sometimes. But uh, avoid tick infested areas, particularly during the high uh, tick times of the year. You know, stay on, the, stay on the bike paths. Don't go walking through the woods, things like that. Um, tick checks, it does help. It's kind of hard to find ticks on dogs and cats sometimes, but they do tend to stay around the head, on the, on the belly, places like that. So doing check, tick checks on them does work. Um, and then also landscaping or spraying your yard does help. Uh, there are some pet specific measures that can be taken. You know, most everybody should be aware now if you have a pet, a dog or a cat, that we have topical products. There's many different types of uh, effective topical products that are available for fl flea and tick control on dogs and cats. And those things do work. They need to be applied regularly. And out here I do recommend that uh, clients use them year round, every month year round, even in, the, even in February. I've taken, tick, I've taken adult deer ticks off of dogs in February, so. Um, keep in mind they're not repellents. They don't keep them off the pets. They only kill them if they attach. So you can still, even if you're applying them correctly, those topical products, you can still find ticks on your pets. And there's some question, there's many different types of active ingredients that we have available in these products. Personally, I kind of feel like the Fipronil products, uh, the, the products that contain Fipronil as the active tick killing ingredient, that they pro I think they work better. I think they offer a longer protection and things like that. Uh, and then for dogs, we do have vaccinations, which I do think are effective uh, for a Lyme disease, not for anaplasmosis, but for Lyme disease. And um, uh, we also have routine screening for these two, two uh, uh, diseases in dogs. So doing routine screenings helps us to identify has that dog been exposed? Should we do something else? Things like that. Now this is, I don't want to throw too much information, but I just put it out there anyway. I'd, so in preparation for some of these meetings, I uh, just randomly grabbed 100 records out of my client list and dog records and just basically did a survey of 100 dogs and I gotta get the pointer working. So I, I counted 100 records and um, there were, out of those 100 records, there were 40 dogs that were negative for both Lyme disease and anaplasmosis, which means the other 60 these are, were uh, positive for either anaplasmosis, Lyme disease were three, and then there were 19 dogs that were positive for both diseases. So what does that say? Well, there was a 60%, that's, that's why I did 100, because I easy math. Uh, so 60% of the dogs, hey, listen, epidemiology, that's what the training did for me. So 60% of the dogs were positive for anaplasmosis, Lyme disease, or both, okay? So, and of these dogs, now remember this is a combination dog, he's positive for both things, but of these dogs, anaplasmosis outranked Lyme disease three to one. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and I think that there's some reasons for that. Uh, and again, there's to be a whole host of things, but from stuff that we have potentially control over, one thing is that uh, there are some thoughts that from the time of attachment, you know, the tick attaches to both us and our dog, that anaplasmosis is possibly transmitted much sooner than Lyme disease. Lyme disease is known to take about basically 51 hours or something like that, but basically 48 hours to be transmitted from time of attachment. That's what Malcolm was referring to as far as, you know, do your tick check and get the thing off, and if you've, you get it off soon, then your chances of getting Lyme disease are very low. Anaplasmosis is thought to be able to be transmitted within 24 hours. So if you look at, you know, the idea that, well, maybe these ticks 
that have attached to the pad, even if the fipronil is working or you find the tick, that maybe, poss possibly, that anaplasmosis is easier to transmit to the dogs than, than what Lyme disease is. So maybe that plays a role. The other thing is, you know, we, I do, within my clients, uh, strongly recommend that they vaccinate their dogs for Lyme disease, and I think that that has some bearing as far as uh, these dogs getting clinical disease. All right. What about ticks? Things I've just learned in my practice. Uh, ticks can be anywhere because the deer can be anywhere. I mean, you know, the, that's how these ticks get around. And, and from location to location, and you know, we, everybody, probably everybody here is scared deer off their deck, so. Um, they, but they can also be very focal, too. I mean, you, you know, if you've had these experiences, you can have a heavy tick infestation in your yard in one part of your yard and nothing in, in the whole rest of the yard. And I think a lot of that has to do with possibly where the mice are or maybe where the, beer, where the deer bed down or fed that night or something to that degree. But they, they can be very focal. Um, the adults are actually present year-round, although those pictures and the life cycle makes you think that there are tick-free times of the year, that's just not the case. The nymphs and the larvae are very seasonal, but the adults can be year-round, so it's a year-round risk. Uh, and they can kind of be suddenly around a home, and what I mean by that is I've had you know, numerous clients that have never had uh, uh, tick problems, and all of a sudden comes the springtime, they let Fifi out, and Fifi goes running around in the bushes and comes back just mauled in ticks particularly the nymphs and the, and the larva. And I just think that that's just a uh, uh, happen ch chance that the deer walked to the yard that year, something to that degree is my thoughts. But it's just kind of important to keep those things in mind. Uh, and then I also get a little bit concerned sometimes about the seasonal owners. I think it's the same time, same issue with the pets as it is with the uh, uh, people that come out for the season. So that's kind of the end of what I would say is my Nantucket experience. Me and a vet, I've got to show my pets. So those are our two dogs, Dallas and uh, Dodger, on our deck at our house. So. Oops. The one on the left is my dog. He's a cattle dog. He's the smartest dog in the world. He tries to read my mind. I only have this one because I'm married to my wife. And she, she loves chows. He's an asshole. <laughs> He's, he's a good chow, but he's, I tell you what, I don't want you all to go get chows for Christmas. Um, at this point, I think we have some time for questions for Drs. McNabb and White. So does anybody have a question? Um, I love venison. And this is the first time I've thought that the meals I've enjoyed may have permethrin in them. No, 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 no. Those animals that have been contacted with a four-poster, it was an issue on Shelter Island. Shelter Island has 64 posters on the entire island. They live by it. And some of the, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Some of the studies there suggested that it's the meat from the meat. Has not necessarily been confirmed. I wouldn't worry about it. If you're eating meat from Shelter Island, So just to recap, in case you couldn't hear, no permethrin in the Nantucket deer. So if you're eating venison from Nantucket, you're okay. Yes. Another, whoop, another question in the back. Do you have a figure on the deer hunt for this year? How many were taken? I heard it was excellent and the hunters were very happy. I don't. I don't have those numbers, no. no. Yeah. Those numbers are probably not available yet. Uh, they don't usually do their calculations until later in the year. They usually go to the previous year's hunt uh, data that usually becomes available sort of like late summer or fall. But they probably have some calculations yet. Yeah. And the average number is somewhere between 500 and 600. Yeah. No, I mean, so we did, you know, we did petition the state to change the regulations so a hunter could carry more than one deer at a time before being tagged. Now that took us two years, all right, for the state to approve that, but at least they approved of that. And we suggested some other things to the state of extending archery season, but we figured that would be at least two years before that happens. Things go slowly. All the statistics, too, 
all the numbers of uh, medical statistics are all 2011. You know, a few but those deer numbers I showed uh, from the aerial survey are a month old. Those are the, the most recent statistics I have. Is the question here? Um, I believe it was uh, about three years ago that a new tick to this area was found in Barnstable County called the Lone Star Tick. Um, I was just wondering if anyone has any information on whether that tick, which carries a whole host of yeah. new diseases, has been yeah. found yet on Nantucket. The Lone Star Tick originally started in, in the southwest of Texas and managed to get all the way to the northeast. It carries anaplasmosis, it carries tularemia, for example, which are diseases that have been found on this island. However, I don't know if anyone has found a uh, Lone Star Tick on Nantucket yet, but they are. I expect we will. Now, the Lone Star Tick is very different than the Black Legged Tick. The Black Legged Tick does not move. Yeah, the, the Black Legged Tick, it, it will see, it will fall to the ground, it will stay there, and then it will wait for somebody to walk by. The Lone Star Tick will actually go and shake you. That is a frightening thought. Um, one of your slides uh, showed that an area that has no deer has no uh, uh, Lyme disease. Does that area also have no white mice? It can't sustain the population. Areas where deer have been reduced, you still have some level of Lyme disease. We will never, ever There are questions right over here. Yeah, ju just making a comment, uh, when you had talked about uh, checking yourself and taking the tick off, uh, I had an interesting conversation with the emergency room down at Nantucket Hospital. 
And they said, don't pull it off. Take a cotton ball, squirt it with liquid soap, and rub it in a circular direction for about 30 seconds, and the tick will come out. And in fact, it does. And so that's just something that I, I thought was an interesting way, rather than pulling it out and perhaps leaving some of the tick inside. So that was just a point. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Um, did, have you, were there maps produced of the recent um, infrared surveys? Was there a, a distribution of deer on the yes. island? And You have a question over here. Was the uh, human vaccine and the dog vaccine the same? Could we just adjust it uh, <laughs> using Young's rule? I think Lyme is human. Yes. Scott just answered my question because I wanted to point out that the uh, vaccine was unique to Lyme disease and unfortunately would give people a false sense of security in going outside thinking that they're protected and suddenly find out that they come home with anaplasmosis or babesiosis. There's a question here. This is very informative. Thank you. Um, I'm, ha I'm one of those lucky <laughs> residents that lives in Tom Never. So um, we did put up a deer fence. Um, we invested a lot of money in this. And then the deer would, not the deer, but actually the deer too would come through the gate slats. So we had to, you know, put barriers there as well. Um, I know that you talked about Daminex tubes and our, so our Tom Nevers Association recommended those. So, you know, at 150 bucks every six months, if, if we had a deer fence, do you think, you know, that's something we don't really need to do? I know you can't endorse it or not, but I think what the, would you? The Nantucket Board of Health or the Nantucket Tick-Borne Disease Committee could not endorse them. Okay. All right. All right. I'll... What about bunny rabbits? Is, are they an issue? Well, a lot of people think bunny rabbits would be great because they eat the ticks. But the problem with the bunny rabbits is they are very particular about what kind of ticks they eat. They don't necessarily <laughs> eat the black legged ticks or the other one. And bunny rabbits, yes, bunny rabbits can, can carry a, a tick. <clears throat> I thought I saw a hand over there. Wait, okay. here's.
I had a couple of things. Um, I attend Lyme conferences, and they talk about the fact that other insects also carry these diseases. Do you know anything about that? They're talking about mosquitoes and green flies among them. Well, I, there is a fear of flies. Yeah. Right, there's plenty of other diseases we could talk about carried by insects, but not Lyme. <clears throat> if the vaccine is uh, available in Europe, if I go there and get it, how, when do, how soon do I have to go back? It's about 80% of that, and probably need to go to the year. Every year? Right. It's a good reason to go to Europe every year. <laughs> Get your flu shot there too, perhaps. Other questions? Well, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. McNabb and Dr. White. It's uh, very informative. Thank you so much.